Graphic Audio presents an audio guide to Doomsday Warrior by Ryder Stacy. Presented in rich, vivid graphic audio. A movie in your mind. Time. It is 2089. An all-out nuclear war has killed two-thirds of the world's population. The Russians, who were able to get off many more of their missiles in a first strike, were victorious over the United States. Now, in control of all of the world except China, they ruthlessly rule the People's World Socialist Republic. Place. Atomic bombs exploded all over the planet, but primarily in the United States. The U.S. lost 100 million people within one hour of the attack. Another 75 million died within a year. The Russians immediately moved in with massive transports of troops and weapons and quickly took control of much of the country. They built 40 fortresses in vital parts of the U.S., huge military complexes from which they send out search and destroy units of tanks and helicopters and radiation-suited troops to extinguish the still-burning embers of resistance. The Russians use the American citizens as slave labor, forcing them to grow crops and work in factories. The Russian high command lives in luxury, the officers having taken the best housing in the remaining cities. The American workers must make do in shabby shanty towns around the fortress complexes. 35 million Americans are directly under the red rule. Sullen and docile, they carry out their Russian master's orders. But underneath, they hate them. They pray for the day when the legendary Ted Roxon, the ultimate American, will come with the free fighters of the hidden cities and release them from their bondage. Environment. The great number of bombs set off altered the Earth's axis. The polar caps began melting and the forested regions turned to desert. The world is slowly warming the higher amount of CO2 in the air creating a greenhouse effect. Lakes, rivers and streams have dried up in many places. Ecology has almost been dealt a death blow from the war. 90% of the Earth's species of plants and animals are now extinct. The east coast of the United States is still extremely radioactive. Vast, bare plains stretch hundreds of miles in New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, upon which nothing grows. At the edges of these hot zones are forests of mutated bushes and trees, covered with thorns and rock-hard bark. Parts of the Midwest were spared, as the Russians had plans for eventually using the farmland to grow crops for their own clamoring masses back home. But the soil is now too radioactive to grow anything but weeds. American slave labor was taken out by the truckload to work, turning the soil in the medium hot zones, meaning death within a year from handling the rocks and topsoil still hot enough to send a Geiger counter off the edge. The far west has been hit hard. Colorado was spared, mostly because of some bad aiming. But further on, in Utah, Nevada, California, there has been heavy damage. The area is now a misty, unknown land, inhabited by bizarre species of mutants and cannibals. Volcanoes and earthquakes have become common, and much of the Northwest has been turned into a nightmare of craters some miles wide. The South was hit in a haphazard fashion, as if the Russians hadn't quite known what to strike. Some states, for instance, New Mexico, Georgia, were almost untouched, while others, Florida and Texas, were blasted to bits. Parts of Florida were gone. Where Orlando and Tampa once stood was now a great jagged hydrogen bomb created canal that stretched hundreds of miles across the interior, filled with a red, muddy water. Slowly, life tries to force its way back onto the surface of the ripped and savaged land. Many forests have expanded over the last century in areas that weren't hit. 
Great parts of the United States are now thick with brush and trees and resemble the country the way it looked in the 1800s. In other places, the deserts cover the earth for four or five hundred miles in every direction. Unrelenting, broiling, hot, snake-filled and cactus-dotted obstacles that stand between other living parts of the country. The Hidden Free Cities Over 75 free American hidden towns have sprung up over the years. Located at the edges of hot zones, which the Russian troops are reluctant to enter, these towns, hidden in caves, mountains, deep wooded valleys, are made up of armed resistance fighters. Each free city consists of anywhere from 1,000 to 40,000 people. They are fiercely democratic, using town meetings to discuss and vote on all issues. The free Americans, who have been bred out in the country away from the Russian-dominated clean areas, have, through natural selection, become ten times more resistant to radiation than their ancestors. They are bred tough, with children placed out in the 20 below zero nights. If the child lives, it is allowed to develop. If not, then it is just as well to put it out of its misery now. Ted Roxon fights out of Century City, one of the more advanced free cities, and the manufacturer of the Liberator automatic rifle, used by free fighters everywhere. They attack Russian convoys, blow up bridges, but they plan for the day when they can begin their all-out assault on the enslavers. The Russians. The United Socialist States of America is run by the red-faced, heavy-drinking General Zhabnov, headquartered in the White House, Washington, D.C., now called New Lenin. A bureaucrat, careful but not cunning, and a libertine, Zhabnov spends days eating and nights in bed with young American girls rounded up and drugged by his terror squads. Zhabnov has been appointed Supreme President of the U.S. for a 10-year period, largely because he is the nephew of the Russian Premier Vasily. General Zhabnov rules America as his personal fiefdom. The only rules he must obey are that there be no uprisings, and 75% of the country's crops, grown by the enslaved American workers, must be sent to Russia. General Zhabnov believes that the situation in the U.S. is stable, that there are no American resistance forces to speak of, other than the few scattered groups that raid convoys from time to time. He sees his stay here as a happy interlude away from the power struggles back in the Kremlin. Colonel Kilov is the head of the KGB in the U.S., headquartered in Denver, Colorado. Thin, almost skeletal, with a long face, sunken cheekbones, and thin lips that spit words, his ultimate goal is to wrench power from the premier and take his place as ruler of the world. Colonel Kilov believes General Zhabnov to be a fool. Kilov knows that the American forces are growing stronger daily and forming a nationwide alliance to fight together. The comparatively calm days of the last century are about to end. From Moscow, Premier Vasily rules the world. Never has one man ruled so much territory. From the bottom of Africa to Siberia, from Paraguay to Canada, Russian armies are everywhere. A constant flow of supplies and medical goods is needed to keep the vast occupying armies alive. Russia herself did not go unscathed in the war. 24 American missiles reached the Soviet Union, wiping out Minsk, Odessa, Leningrad, and Volgograd. The rest of the U.S. strike was knocked out of the skies by Russian killer satellites that shot down beams of pure energy and picked them off like clay pigeons. Vasily is besieged on all sides by problems. His great empire is threatening to break up. Everywhere there are rebel attacks on Russian troops, in Europe, in Africa, in India, and especially in America. The forces of the resistance troops are growing larger and more sophisticated in their operations. Vasily is a highly intelligent and well-read man. He has devoured history books on other great leaders and the problems they faced. Advisors tell him to send in more forces and quickly crush the insurgents, but Vasily believes that to be a tremendous waste of manpower. 
If it goes on like this, he may have to use neutron bombs again. Order must be maintained. For Vasily knows his history. One thing that has been true since the dawn of time, wherever there has been a great empire, there has come a time when it began to crumble. They will be led by one man. That man is Ted Roxon, the Doomsday Warrior. Be firing! How many do you have left? Two! Me too! One, three! One, two, three! Uh, Think that's all of them? Let me see. Uh. Yeah. That's quite a mess we've made. The Reds now have the Mind Breaker. Don't you see that device near you? The chair? Won't you have a seat? We must immediately mount a rescue operation and attack. I want them off the ground in three minutes. We will use two of the neutron bombs I have stored away just for this eventuality. We already know they made Preston talk. saw what the result of that was. Every minute could mean the difference between life and death for every man, woman, and child in Century City. Come on, let's go. No! The truck's gonna get to us soon! We have a situation here in America. A critical one. Never mind! Kill Ted Roxon. Free is beyond what is here around you now. You must look beyond, beyond the destroyed land, beyond this fort, and see the new world that was and will be again. Doomsday Warrior, in graphic audio, a movie in your mind. Fire! <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah, I packed the explosive shells. Hope you didn't mind. Don't miss the adventure into the apocalyptic world of the Doomsday Warrior. Available in its entirety, all available at www.graphicaudio.net.